Good morning, everybody. This is your Toronto Realtor, Christina Croner, sales representative at Remax Hallmark, and I'm proud to have my favorite real estate lawyer, Mitch Corman, here live on my call. Um, my clients rant and rave about how amazing him and his team are with um, every single transaction. Uh, it's all been compliments throughout, so I'm very happy to have him live and answering your COVID-19 real estate law questions. So thank you and welcome, Mitch. Thank you, Christina. Happy, happy to be here. How is everything going with COVID-19? Is your office still operating? Very good question. It's, uh, it's strange but true. So, you know, 10 weeks ago, there were 30 of us essentially in, in our law firm working out of mainly one office. Like about 25 people were in one office and we had about five people uh, scattered throughout. We had people in, in, um, in Ottawa and in Durham. And now we basically have about three people working in the office on any given day, maybe four people in the office and everybody else is working remotely from home and closing the deals as they would be otherwise. Uh, it's a huge transition for us. Uh, we were ready for it. You know, we, we went out and bought laptops for people and, and uh, did an interface so that we could save things into the cloud. Uh, but it's actually worked out remarkably well. And not being a, I'm not a techie guy. Uh, we have a, I've got other lawyers in the office that are very techie. Uh, they spearheaded this initiative and, uh, and it worked out incredibly well. Amazing. Did you already have most of your documents in a secure cloud beforehand, or did you have to transition to paperless and virtual before you could do this? No, well, we had a mixture. We, so we, did, we were backing everything up into the cloud beforehand uh, from a server in our office. However, in the last year, the, uh, the company that provides us with our, um, our database management basically went from being server-based to the cloud, and that happened probably about a year ago, actually. Mm -hmm. So we've, we were one of the first to make that transition. So we were well ahead of the curve in that sense. And that was just by luck that we were already, you know, up and ready to go with everything being virtual and, in, and saved in the cloud. So uh, we had much less stressful time than many other firms out there. That's amazing. So you were ahead of the game. Yes. Uh, same with my real estate business too. I've been paperless since 2011. Um, I had my iPad with me by my side for every single transaction. And then as soon as legal signatures, um, electronic signatures could be used legally on agreement of purchase and sale, then I started using them immediately. But even before they were legal on the APS, I was using them for um, the buyer representation agreement or uh, leases because that was still legal. And it was a great way to get um, practice with e-signatures and get my clients practice with it too. So as soon as we were allowed to use it, boom, I was ready. And same with COVID, I'm well versed with DocuSign while many other agents are just trying to figure it out. Yep. And it's, uh, it's made life way, way easier for, for us who were already going down that path beforehand. Real estate closing paperwork had to be signed in person or at least witnessed by a lawyer in person. So I heard also that there was a change to the law society recently that's allowing the electronic signatures. Could you elaborate on that? Yeah. So, you know, the same way you were allowed to, when you went to DocuSign, it was spearheaded by, you know, your governing boards like uh, RICO and ARIA allowing you to use DocuSign as a method of signing uh, transactions. We are beholden to the Law Society of Ontario. So we can only do what the Law Society allows us to do. So even though you guys were ahead of us by actually about two years in allowing electronic signatures and the Law Society, it was only because of COVID-19 that they're allowing us to use electronic versions of signatures. And in addition to that, we also act for a buyer on a, on a purchase transaction. We're acting for a buyer and we're also acting for the mortgage lender. So for a bank and the bank also dictates to us how they want documents signed. So even if the law society allows us to use electronic signatures, if the lender says, no, we still want a wet signature, wet meaning handwritten signature, we have to meet with a client or get that wet signature. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's been um, you know, challenging for us because there's a hundred different banks out there or a hundred different lenders out there and everybody wants something specific and we have to, you know, do whatever they're asking us to do. Sometimes that's a signature that is just a wet signature, which means it's, it's handwritten. Sometimes it's a wet signature that is actually witnessed, which might mean witnessing it in the same place, in, in, within the same proximity. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it means witnessing it over 
Zoom or you know Google Meets is fine. And you know, and other lenders are are just fine with us having a straightforward electronic signature like a DocuSign signature. It's um, you know, it's unfortunate that there isn't just one standardized practice for us. Um, but we adapt to whatever the lenders need and uh, with and keep within what the law society requires. Are you finding any delays with closing now that everyone has to transition to a virtual uh, workspace and uh, social distancing? Uh, interestingly enough, the delays in closing don't have anything to do with the social distancing. Uh, we've had, we closed a lot of deals last month. Um, we had a huge backlog in, uh, in deals that were in our pipeline. So month of April, we were closing over 250 deals. And the ones that didn't close on time we're all relating to wire problems. So okay. by wire problems, when what we used to do when we were closing deals is most of them we were certifying checks, sending those checks over to the law firm on the other side, and they were sending us documents. So there'd be a, lots of couriers back and forth on closing day. Mm -hmm. Now, because of COVID-19, we are electronically sending documents. We're you know emailing them because we don't have to, we were sending them physical documents because we were sending them certified checks anyway. Mm -hmm. So we, if we're sending one courier, we might as well put everything into one package and send it. So yeah. now we're not doing that anymore. So now we're wiring funds and lawyers like all over the province are wire, trying their best to wire funds and the wire departments in banks aren't, weren't ready for this. So you've got small wire departments, you know, I'm, I'm visualizing, I don't, I've never seen a wire department of a bank, but I've <laughs> Maybe there's I like, it like an people. old switchboard. <laughs> yeah. And you, you know, you prepare a wire electronically and you transmit it. Like, so that's, we were already set up to do this and we've been wiring funds for, for years. Um, you transmit it and then it goes into the wire department or a TD. Mm -hmm. And then that wire department gets it and then sends it to bank of Nova Scotia or bank of Montreal or whoever. Mm -hmm. And then there has to be a receiving person in that wire department at the other end. And there just doesn't seem to be enough people working in these wire departments. And then well, wires get lost. So, uh -huh. and we have nobody to talk to. So what happens is, you know, we send a wire and it, you know, the lawyer on the other side says, well, it hasn't hit my bank account yet. Mm -hmm. And we keep checking and checking and checking and time's ticking away. Cause we want to close the deal by five o'clock. When the land registry office closes, we want to register by five o'clock mm -hmm. and by 10 to five, it's still not there. And they're calling us back saying, where's the money? And then we're calling our rep in commercial banking at TD and they're saying, well, you know, I'll try and get a hold of somebody in the wire department. And then they can't get a hold of somebody in the wire department because they can't, they don't have the phone number, the wire department. They're only allowed <laughs> to send an email to the wire department. So when you've got at the end of the month, when you've got, you know, 50 or hundred deals to close and everybody in the city is trying to close all their deals at the end of the month, there's a huge backlog and the wires, you know, take a long time. So we had one at the end of this past month that was actually TD to TD and it took seven hours for that wire to land. Eventually wow. every wire did land and every deal did close, but it wasn't without frustration and heartache and stress on us as lawyers. And you know, we have the clients calling on the other line saying, when can we get our keys? When can we get our keys? The movers are ready to go. And, mm -hmm. and then we can't release the keys until the other lawyer says, yeah, I got the money and I'm registering. And then we close. So that's, that's been the biggest frustration and it's, it's something that could easily be fixed. It just needs more resources put into these wire departments, recognizing that this is the way everything's being done now. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and, and I'm sure that the banks will fix that. Uh, it's just taking a little bit of time. And I'm sure that with COVID-19, one benefit to this um, terrible situation is that we're going to speed up our rate of innovation. So these sorts of things like issues with wire transfers would probably happen once in a while, but not at the same regularity that they're happening now. So now it's going to be brought to their attention. Hey, we should innovate this and uh, we're going to be implementing time saving and money saving productivity hacks everywhere after COVID-19. Yep. Um, I've been sitting on a, a group. It's, a, it's like a large value money transfer group that was set up by the uh, government. It's a, it's a federally set up thing. A couple of years ago, they set up a, a think tank basically on how to transfer large sums of money more easily. And this was two years ago and they haven't come up with any solutions or any changes. So it's been a long time coming for that. And it, now it's going to happen really, really quickly. Mm -hmm. Just like finding a cure or finding a virus, basically. Uh, sorry, finding a vaccine to the virus. That's going to happen very quickly, I think, also because the resources are going to that. Same way the resources will go to 
finding a better way to transfer money because the banks are, you know, when you think about how many people are working in the banks, how many people like me are bugging our bank representative who is trying to get a hold of somebody else. And it's not just me. It's like, you're just wasting tons of the time of the bank's resources and people trying to track these things. Um, you know, I think there's got to be a better way electronically and the bank will save a lot of money once they, when, once all the banks figure out a better way to, uh, to transfer funds. And also save money instead of having to curry your actual bank drafts. Absolutely. Yeah. So this is going to be an exciting uh, thing that we'll watch and see what kind of innovation comes out of COVID. Yeah. And another thing that comes to mind is we used to courier keys from one law, law firm to another. We're not doing that anymore. Now we're, no, we're exactly. asking agents like you to put, leave the keys in a lockbox at the house and we'll release the number to lockbox when the deal has closed. That's a great innovation. And it's so simple. Um, but it's wonderful, it's working, and uh, much easier for the clients. Because now we don't have to tell the clients, oh, you got to come back to our law firm, pick up <laughs> keys, and then go to the house while they're busy trying to move and keep their movers on track. It's, um, it's much, much better, much easier. And as you've seen many times in the past, I've come to your office before closing. I always call Sam, and I'm like, let's make sure the keys are at the front desk of coming. Yep. <laughs> Put my name on the envelope. And I pick them up on behalf of my clients who couldn't make it downtown before um, the end of their workday. So uh, it's definitely going to be great to be able to pick them up through the lockbox and save everybody time and money. Yeah. So the, the good thing about COVID-19, if there is any good thing, is that it actually is forcing you, me, banks, everybody to work smarter with the processes that we do mm -hmm. and to make sure that we're giving the clients a great experience. We're, we're upping our game. We're just doing a better job to make sure the clients, at the end of the day, they have to have a great experience, whether they're buying in the middle of a pandemic or selling in a pandemic or whatever. And these changes, I'm confident, will flow through to everything we do, you know, from here on in. And that's a great segue into my next question. So how are buyers buying in a pandemic? What happens if a buyer comes down with COVID-19? if it's actually diagnosed and they're in the hospital and closing day is tomorrow, what, what can they do? Well, fortunately that hasn't happened to us yet. Um, I'm hoping it never happens to us. We haven't had a client that's, uh, uh, that all of a sudden got very sick and wasn't able to close their deal. Um, typically what happens when, when one side or the other, there's the law and then there's what's really, what really happens. So the law is that deals have to close on closing days. And if they don't close, if you're a buyer, you could lose your deposit. If you're a seller, you could be dragged into litigation uh, to, you know, and forced to sell your house at some later date and time. But we also we, we also know that the courts are basically closed too, except for emergencies. So there's nothing, there's no way to enforce your rights through the courts unless it's a, a real emergency. Mm -hmm. So what really happens when somebody gets sick? When somebody gets sick, we postpone a closing date. That's really what happens. We get on the phone with the law firm on the other side and we explain to them what's happened. And we, you know, we give them an idea of, you know, what state the person is in. And we say, you know, it might be, look, we have to close in 14 days from now. So let's say the person that is sick is a seller. The buyer is not going to want to go into a seller's house if they know they have COVID-19 anyway. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> so the buyer is going to want to wait until... 14 days pass or whatever. And a buyer is not going to want to try to kick a person out, move, move them with COVID-19, tell them they, oh, they must go to the, some other house or some other apartment <laughs> or wherever they happen to be moving to while they are sick and suffering. Mm -hmm. So we, we negotiate an extension to the closing. Okay. And so everything is a negotiation. And I guess yes. that COVID-19 happens to be the hot topic right now, but um, this could also happen if someone was in a car accident or some other form of illness at any time before closing, right? Absolutely. It could happen for any reason. And it has happened in the past for a myriad of reasons. And that's what we do. Our job is to negotiate something that's fair for both sides. So mm -hmm. negotiating a extension to a closing. So let's say it's a, a seller that can't close and they can't get out of the house because of COVID-19 and the buyer is expecting to move in. If that buyer has to put their goods in storage, or move into a hotel or whatever for whatever whatever it costs them to extend the seller would have to pay the buyer for the, those costs mm -hmm. but those costs are tiny in relation to what it would cost if they were to sue each other mm -hmm. or 
you know, if you were, or the, the health cost, if you were to try to force a person with COVID-19 out of their house and into some other house. So, you know, we, we try to act as reasonably as we can and we negotiate a settlement lawyer to lawyer and, you know, the clients have to approve whatever we do, but I, I haven't heard of anyone um, not closing or, or uh, sort of anyone going to litigation because they didn't close due to uh, getting sick from COVID-19. So it's, um, you know, it is, it is within the realm of possibility, but it's highly, the, pro the probability is very, very unlikely. Mm -hmm. And if it did happen, we, we have things that we can do um, to make it better for both sides. Mm -hmm. and, and hope we don't actually have a real life case example on that one in the future. Um, now that actually segues into another question that one of my clients had. Now, what about purchaser visits that are happening? Um, we know that uh, there may or may not be someone at home who could be sick with COVID. Could a seller refuse a buyer purchaser visit? And if they do, or if the buyer is uncomfortable about going into a home with a seller who's living there, are there any alternatives that buyers can have for a purchaser visit? Well, first and foremost, uh, buyers are entitled to get the house or condo in the way that they saw it when it was presented to them. So the purpose of purchaser visits are really to make, take measurements, make sure that the house is still in the same condition. Um, it's not to renegotiate a deal. So if a, buy, if a seller refuses to allow you in, you can't walk away from a deal. It's not a breach of a deal because it's not a fundamental part of the transaction. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it does happen. It could happen for many different reasons, but most often right now it's happening because they don't want to have, you know, another person visiting their house or another with another agent because they're fearful of COVID-19. Mm -hmm. So if they, if you're not allowed to go in for another visit and you, you would still close on that house, if there is something that you found when you did go into the house, we tell every client that we have, you know, as soon as you get the keys, go into the house, inspect the house, Make sure everything works. Make sure there isn't any new damage. If anything happened to that house, you have to let us know. So, for example, let's say the movers um, broke a window accidentally. They, you have to take a picture, send it to us. We'll send it to the lawyer on the other side and say, hey, you know, the, your movers broke a window. We expect the seller to pay for the repair of that window or a huge scratch on the floor or whatever the, the damage might be. That's always happened. Um, but now it's, it's more forefront in people's minds because they might not be able to do that inspection right before closing, but that's okay. And usually what happens is the, you know, the buyer will go out and get a quote to fix that window and we sell it to send it to the seller and the seller pays for the repair of the window. Easy peasy. Mm -hmm. So the, the other issue, the second half of your question, sorry, I, um, we'll, so instead we'll, of doing a visit, um, our buyers, oh, yeah, right. The other, the other way of doing visits, right. Yeah. So like FaceTime or. Yeah, so now I'm seeing agents that are asking their seller clients to just, let's do a FaceTime video. So instead of doing a face-to-face -face video or a face-to-face -face visit, they're going on FaceTime, the homeowner is going on FaceTime and walking around the house with their phone and doing a video while the agent is asking, oh, can you show me, can you open up that cupboard and can you show me what it looks like the ceiling of that cupboard or can you open up the stove or can you go downstairs and basically the homeowner is doing their own video walking around the house so that the purchaser can do their last visit in that way so the purchaser feels comforted knowing that yeah the house looks the same way and everything's great mm -hmm. and which is wonderful comfort for a purchaser and but remember that e even so when the movers go through if something does get damaged we'll fix it after closing. Mm -hmm. Purchasers don't have to worry about stuff like that. And what a cool memory it would be too. It's like how everyone talks about their memories of Toronto blackout. We're gonna talk about how they purchased a home during COVID successfully with FaceTime, fire visits and electronic signing. Yeah, and I've, I've heard that there have been some homeowners that are doing these FaceTime videos and they're doing narratives while they go through the house. So they've, this is the house they've lived in for 20 years and they love this house and their kids grew up here and they start talking about all their memories room to room as they go through the house. So I've heard that that, that has happened a number of times too, which is uh, very sweet. Very heartwarming. Yes. What, what do you think is gonna happen in the future? Do you think that um, we're gonna continue with some of these measures of doing uh, video instead of in-person visits? I don't think so. I think that 
when we get back to normal, like if um, COVID-19 becomes, if they find a cure or a vaccine and, and life really does get back to normal, I think people like the personal touch. I think they'll want to go back and visit. Um, they'll want to see their realtors and be out there with their realtors on every home inspection and, and looking at every house. Now, we have some people that are looking at condos, looking to buy condos without ever walking into the condo. So I've seen deals now that, you know, you get your, you know, you, you're looking at these condos virtually, and then the realtor is preparing an offer, and it's a sight unseen offer. So in, in essence, you're agreeing to buy the condo, but it's conditional on your being able to view it within five days. So they do the agreement of purchase and sale ahead of time, and the seller agrees to the, that agreement of purchase and sale, and then the buyer go, gets to go in and view the property for uh, at one time, and then they can decide if they want to firm up or walk away. I think that that's amazing because look, every, we're trying to adapt to the circumstances we have and use whatever tools we have to continue on. And that, that seems to be a great one too. Um, depending, it all depends on everybody's individual circumstance and their ind individual fears. And we try to accommodate them as best we can relative to what fears that they're experiencing or, or have. And, um, but I, I really do think that we will get back to normal and, you know, I think that we'll be signing up clients in our office again, even though it's working. Um, we, we'd it's rather, we'd normal. rather see our clients. We, we really would. We'd rather, and I'd rather be in my office with all of my staff because it feels like I'm away from my family and in, and in a sense it is. So I think that we will get back to normal. Yeah, you have an amazing staff. It's been incredible working with everyone from your team. Adam Richardson handles a lot of my clients. Um, Yemi as well. Um, Max, uh, Mike. It's just been incredible. Really, really good team of people you have with you. Yeah, and I, I get to see them Fridays at 5.30. We all get together on Zoom so that we can actually see each other's faces. And, uh, you know, we have a virtual cocktail together. Um, That's a great idea. I, I miss them all and they miss us. You know, the strength of our firm is really in our staff. Um, it's not that we are rocket scientists in, you know, the minutia of law. It's really our dedication to making sure the client experience is great and our dedication to each other within our office. That's what, that's what makes us great. Yeah. Clients and uh, realtors alike, we can definitely feel that. Um, I've noticed that every transaction I've had with your office, uh, knock on wood, <laughs> has been completely smooth, problem-free, happy, great, just excellent all around, which I find is rare. And I also love that uh, your office and your team updates realtors when the property closes <laughs> because no one else does that. So we're usually the last ones to know if a property closes. We're usually texting a buyer on closing, hey, did you get your keys? And they're like, oh yeah, I got them three hours ago. <laughs> It's, uh, it's so important because you're the reason why they're going to have a great experience. You're, you've been integral in that client's purchase or sale of that property. You need to, you know, we call the client, the next call we make is to the agent because it's so important for you. You deserve to share in their happiness and joy and their whole experience. And the clients want you to. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's why we do that. I think that uh, we're going to open up by summer. Do you think it's going to be in the fall? Your thoughts on COVID? I, um, there's lots of talk about how what what's going to happen in real estate and number of transactions, and I I'm leaning towards the fact that I think a year's worth of business is going to happen in the last six months of the year, basically. So I think that things have slowed down considerably, you know, in terms of volume of transactions, and I really do believe that there's a huge pent up demand. And now actually, I think there's also a, a, an increased demand. So it's not just the people who are thinking about buying and selling, or we're gonna buy and sell in February or in March, who are planning for the spring market. I think as soon as things open up a little bit more, which I'm thinking in the next four weeks, things are opening up considerably. Once they open up the malls, you know, it's, uh, everything's open. So you know, now as of uh, this weekend, you know, storefronts are open, um, you know, restaurants are gonna be open soon. Once things start getting back to normal, I think the pent-up demand in real estate is really going to swing into action. So you're going to, I think you're going to see July to December being extremely busy, a busy, busy time because I don't think interest rates are going to go up. I think interest rates are going to stay low at least into the middle of next year to kickstart, to keep the economy kickstarted. 
And I think all the pent up demand is going to continue on. They're good. People are going to get out and buy and sell real estate. But something else that I think is going to happen is people who are in smaller spaces and are thinking about moving into a bigger space, they're going to be moving into a bigger space now. Like maybe they were thinking, okay, I'm going to stay in my 500 square foot condo for three years and then move into 800 square feet. Well, I think they're going to try to figure out a way to get into that 800 square feet now because they're sick of being in 500 square feet for 10 weeks with no place to go. <laughs> Even, you know, I'm in a good size house. Um, you know, I'm in a three and a half bedroom house that's good for my wife and two kids, but I'm, I've got a tiny backyard. I wish I was in a, not, I don't necessarily be in a bigger house, but I certainly wish I had a bigger yard. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, you know, I'm just, we're just cramped in here. And that's not, you know, even though I have a okay size house, I would love to have a bigger house mm -hmm. and a bigger space because I've just learned what it's like to be stuck. I don't know. You can't really see the room I'm in, but the room I'm in is actually, it's maybe 10 feet by 10 feet. <laughs> and every day on Zoom and on my meetings, everything is done in this one little room. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't it be nice? And I've got a tiny little window and not much of a view. Wouldn't it be nice if I had a little bit bigger space? you know, nicer view, um, maybe looking into a nice backyard. And, you know, I think that people are really going to want to uh, upgrade what they're the place that they're living in because of COVID-19. And actually within the last month, I've had a handful of my clients reach out to me saying that exactly that they want to upgrade. Um, maybe even before the summer, they just want to have additional information, whether it be renting or buying a larger property, they just need more space. Many yeah. of my clients, they live and work downtown in the financial district. Some work in law, some work in finance, and they work long, long hours. They often go out for dinner or drinks after work, and they get home just to sleep and shower and then to do that all over again. So if you live a very full, active life downtown, you're barely spending any time at home. So those clients haven't seen the need to invest in a bigger space, but now they're realizing that um, a bigger space and outdoor space is actually the most popular comment I'm getting. Um, tiny condo balconies aren't cutting it anymore. Everyone wants a backyard <laughs> or a terrace. Yeah, before living in the house, I, we lived at the, this, at the distillery district. And, um, and our unit there, we were in small space. It was 850 square foot, two bedroom. Um, except the unit had floor to ceiling windows. So even though you know, it was a smaller space. The fact that it had floor to ceiling win floor to ceiling windows and that we were looking out over the whole downtown of Toronto, it felt like you were in the middle of air, in the middle of a city. So that was actually really good. You know, it was too small, but I did enjoy it because of that, the windows and the feeling that you were in, you know, you had infinite amount of space. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, if I ever went back to a condo, I'd be looking for something like that as well. I have a client who last year I leased them a condo on Temperance Street and it faces, um, their condo faces a wall, like a solid yeah, wall. That. One small window in the entire unit, so very small junior one bedroom, and it faces a wall. There's zero sunlight. You, there, you could reach out almost and touch the, the concrete wall. So my client at the time was like, hey, I don't care. Um, they work right across the street and they said that they would probably never be home during the daylight anyway, so it doesn't matter to them. But now they're like, oh, get me out of this little box. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we're definitely going to see some transitions in both of our industries. And it's going to be exciting times to see what kind of innovation comes out of uh, COVID-19. Um, usually it takes some big disruption of some kind to create innovation. And uh, we didn't know it was going to be a virus, but here it is. And uh, the benefit could be that we'll accelerate innovation, um, save people time, save people money, make things more productive. Yeah, I agree. And great opportunity to, for everybody to up their game. I mean, for you, for me, I mean, it's forcing us to change and adapt. Um, it's forcing homeowners to look at this, you know, the, the surroundings that they're living in, their physical space. It's, um, it, it is disrupting a lot of things, but it will lead to a lot of very, very positive change. And a lot of people doing things that they never thought they were going to be able to do. Fantastic. So if anyone hasn't worked with you yet and would like to, um, would you like to share your contact information, the best way to reach you? 
Yeah, the best way to reach us is our website is cormancompany.com, which is K-O-R-M-A-N-C-O-M-P-A-N-Y.com. Our phone number in Toronto is 416-465-4232. Uh, in Ottawa, we're 613-416-1234. And one, one of the beautiful things about this for us has been, we've always been licensed to practice everywhere in, in Ontario, because when you get your license as a lawyer, you can practice anywhere in Ontario. But we only practiced where we had physical lawyers because we were meeting clients and things like that. So now I'm getting agreements of purchase and sale in from Tobermory, from uh, Windsor, from wherever, because you know, now we can really practice, because everything's being done virtually, we can be providing the same level of service to our clients that we would otherwise. So um, our, our business has expanded tr tremendously um, geographically because of this, which is also really, really interesting. We're closing a lot of deals in Barry. Um, it's awesome. Well, my clients are really gonna be happy to hear that. I know Yemi has met my clients a couple of times at our Richmond Hill Remax Hallmark office. That's been great for clients who live north of Toronto. Absolutely. And yeah, and Yemi will go to Aurora. We, we do have physical lawyers that will go as far north as Barry. Um, but we don't necessarily need to have them going that distance because we can do everything virtually. And does your office only handle real estate? Uh, most of what we do is real estate. So we've got nine lawyers that are doing real estate and we have one lawyer that's doing just wills and estates. So uh, we do, and by just, well, that wills and estates lawyer also does um, some contracts and things like that as well. But um, in real estate, we cover the whole gambit. So if it's uh, real estate work for investors, for people who are leasing properties, commercial <clears throat> purchases and financing, um, anything real estate related, we do. And um, that's basically what the practice is all about. Thank you so much for joining me today, Mitch. Um, you've it's actually answered all of the questions. Um, some came in privately during my chat, but uh, they were all answered in our discussion. So uh, if anyone needs to reach out to you, I'll be posting your contact info below the video and the recording will be on YouTube and uh, Facebook as well for everyone to replay and enjoy. Um, but thank you so much, Mitch, for joining me today. It's been fantastic and thank you for your time. Christina, this has been great for me too. And uh, keep out there, keep buying, selling, and have a great weekend. Thank you, you too. Take care and stay safe. You too.